In the background are pictures like Splendor in the Grass, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Only game in town. And now, Shampoo. We're talking with Warren Beatty. Hello. Hello. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. I think it's somehow being as well-known and almost as elusive as you have been over a rather extensive career, it makes people build up a lot of expectations about you. Does it concern you what people will expect of Warren Beatty when they meet him? <sighs> uh, does it concern me? Well, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think I can cope with it, whatever it is. I, 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 you can't predict it, can you? People are going to have a lot of preconceptions. Some of them are accurate. Some of them are inaccurate, so I try not to think about it. It sounds as though you're secure enough in yourself that you're going to be yourself and everybody can deal with you <laughs> on that level then. Is that it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 We were talking earlier about Splendor in the Grass, which was your first motion picture back in 1960, and you said something interesting, that it had a nice ending. Hmm. Yeah. You deal, do you deal in endings now that you're producing films as well as acting in them? Are those endings always important to you? That's an interesting question. The, the ending of a film is uh, the most important part, I would say. Yeah, that's when you kind of sum it up. All right, Shampoo has a, a strong ending, I mm -hmm. guess it is fair. What would you want that ending to leave with people? Well, first of all, I wouldn't try to articulate because articulate it because uh, that would be uh, that's not that would that would do a disservice really to the to the to the to the film but um, so I will now go ahead and try to articulate it. Uh, <laughs> it 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 has I don't know shampoo is really a picture about uh, sexual and political hypocrisies and the intermingling of those things and the fact that they can't really be separated and so forth and that in the 60s, uh, we've come to uh, ex uh, we've become a part of a, a kind of a sexual permissiveness, or um, a, a, a gradual erosion of what we've called the nuclear family, and I think that sets up a lot of ambivalent feelings in those of us who've been programmed, let's say, before this uh, uh, sexual revolution has taken place, and so we're kind of upset by it. And I would say that. Uh, that the character at the end of Shampoo is uh, unhappy. That doesn't mean that the audience has to be unhappy. And, and also, just because it's um, a, a picture with a lot of superficial people, that, that it, I don't think that means it's a superficial film. But uh, it, it's just a film that tries to take uh, a group of people in a certain place, which is affluent Beverly Hills, on the day that Richard Nixon was elected in 1968. And just tell what happens to him. And the central character is it played by me as a as a hairdresser, who uh, is well what we would call hypersexual. That's active. fair. Yes. And really and, a healthy and fellow. A, well, he's kind of healthy, but he's dumb, kind of. He's a, he's sort of a, the dumb blonde of the movie. Uh, women he's kind of. He's very easily manipulated, isn't he? Well, it? yeah. Women kind of take advantage of him when they want to, and uh, they discard him when they don't. And it's funny because m many people would see the film and say that he takes advantage of those women, I'm when thrilled. in fact everybody, <laughs> when in fact everybody's getting something out of that. Well, it's everybody's kind of lying to everybody else in the movie about everything. And, uh, Can I stop you there? Because when you use the word lying, yeah. you've very carefully chosen things from the 1968 election, the winning of the election mm -hmm. by President Nixon, and speeches that deal in the lies to come. Mm -hmm. And obviously you tried to tie that together. That has a lot to do with your political beliefs, I assume. Well, we all lead political lives, whether we do it by omission or, or commission, and uh, I don't want anybody to think that I would say that these uh, hypocrisies are hypocrisies that are, that are indulged in by Republicans as opposed to Democrats, because I think both political parties uh, have very uh, hypocritical uh, uh, lives. People are aware of your involvement in politics. You've been outspoken about it. I heard you say that uh, you wouldn't know who to back for a Democrat for president now, that Kennedy and Walter Mondale, of course a Minnesotan, had left the race. And that's interesting because you must be very aware. Many people in this country wouldn't even know who Walter Mondale is. Huh. I, I, would, uh, I would say I haven't decided who to, who to work for, who to back. And um, 
I was uh, sad that what Mondale did wasn't perceived more um, definitely as a manifestation of the fact that the system is so tough on presidential candidates that someone who's very stable and sane and with great equilibrium like Walter Mondale, uh, who really is one of the best political men in the country. Oh, I'm, on, I'm in Minneapolis on this show. That's right. Oh, I don't mean to be you turning this into a hype for Walter Mondale, here. but it, he's, a, he's a terrific man. And yes, it's, he is. It's, it's too bad that, uh, that we couldn't take some message from the fact that he didn't seem uh, to want to go through the rigors and the insanities of a presidential campaign. But it is understandable. Oh, it's more than understandable because I, I went through that entire McGovern campaign with McGovern and I, I saw the kind of indignities that he was forced to uh, swallow. And uh, Walter Mondale, well, let's not go on and on about Mondale, but let's go to another question, as a matter of fact. Yeah, all right. <laughs> want to talk about sex again? You want to talk about sex? How is your sex life? Don't tell us that. I shouldn't have asked that. Can we talk about your private life for a moment? Sure. That's not something you're going to shy away from, but people well, who... you see how I dodge. Oh, that, right. So. <laughs> people who are Warren Beatty fans, and there are certainly many, are aware of your extensive relationship with Julie Christie. That is now over, we are told, and that you're no longer living together. Who, who has told you? I'm well, aware. <laughs> we're told you're yeah. no longer living together, mm -hmm. and yet you are in this motion picture together. D uh -huh. Were you still together when you made it, or have you remained friends since your separation? We're very good friends always have been, even during the time we were together, so much of the time. And, and, uh... How is that possible? Most people would say you can't break up a romance and still remain friends. Most people. Well, see, you've been specific about somebody, so I never talk about these things when they're related to one, a specific person, because I feel that not only am I... I have the right to invade my own privacy if I want to, but not the privacy of someone else. So uh, then I try as adroitly as possible to dodge your question and not lose you. You said that you wanted another question. Is this yeah. the time for another go question? Ahead, go ahead. I saw an interview. We're doing this in Chicago now, and I saw an interview on a local television station this morning uh. that I found very troublesome. I found that uh, for perhaps the first four minutes of it, you didn't say a thing. As you travel around the country, and not, I, I think not by choice, <laughs> by the way. I, I think that Other you were, were, talking. were rather run over like a bulldozer. Yeah. Uh, as uh, you travel around the country and have to talk to so many of us, do you find yourself terribly disgusted with many of us? No, not at all. Not at all. How can why, you why do you have that? Did you feel I was disgusted by that show? I didn't, morning? but I was disgusted with them. Why? I thought you were a gentleman. Oh, no. I thought they were talking nicely, and I really had nothing to say. Even if you had, you didn't have the chance to say it. Oh, I had a chance. You can always interrupt. Can't you? When you were campaigning in 1972 yeah. for McGovern, uh, your sister, Shirley MacLaine, was doing exactly the same thing. Are you aligned in a lot of beliefs, or did you just happen to fall in line politically? Well, we have peculiarly parallel lives because we both grew up in Virginia, we both went to New York, we were both in the theater, we went to movies, we became uh, whatever you call it, movie stars. Uh, the level of political activism has increased in both of our lives and uh, so w we can't help but be aware of certain things and uh, generally speaking our politics have, have been very similar. Our approaches have been different. Sometimes Shirley is a. Sometimes Shirley is a little more radical than I am. I might have used the word humorless, perhaps. Oh, I don't think so at all. No. No. Well, I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you disagreeing with me? Well, right? you said I was funnier than Shirley, which is terrific. <laughs> I think you're the first. <laughs> <laughs> the motion picture that Warren Beatty now yeah. stars in is Shampoo. It also stars Julie Christie, Goldie Hawn, Lee Grant, Jack Ward. There's a lot of humor and a lot of irony. And best of all, it stars Warren Beatty. Very nice Thank to you. meet you. Nice Thank to you. meet you too. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment.